That's amazing. I showed up there and he's like, oh yeah, I didn't want to scare you. And I'm like, you're scaring me now? That's not good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. No, because then I ran by him. Like, These are the things I'm going to say. He's like, oh, you can't say that. You can't say that. You can't say that. Can't say that. Like, that's just hurt up my entire speech. Oh. What, what did you want to say that you couldn't say? Well, he said, the first time I met Candace, I was smitten in years before the I didn't know how to do it. She didn't tell me that she's dating somebody else. And I'm like, you can be smitten with that. Yeah, but he didn't want me. No, it is. He really controls the message. Students in the Yeah. And then he's like, so it's like, and I'm like, can I tell him how, you know, when Candace said, because Candace was asking me that. And one of our friends asked her, she's like, what do you think of David? And she was a little drunk. And she's like, he's cute. Yes. And that was it. It went through the campaign, got to me. And we were all trying to plot to get together. Right. And I was like, yeah, I was really embarrassed that she was drinking. She was a lightweight. And I was like, oh, no. So I can't say that, because that's the whole funny part. So I had to, like, scrap that. We were all these things. I was so stressed out. You know, no idea. I mean, you know, I get home and she's stressed out. Like, but you, you get funny. No, that was the funny My opener was funny. Like, thank God for him, Jamie, being the mayor of the Sunday show. Yeah, that's what I was going
I yeah. think. And I, from what I've noticed, people have mentioned about the no. really good questions. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't think. That's for you. Not by design. I don't know if there's anything else public interest related going on today. We work this in, yeah. We'll be having a lot more public interest related stuff in November, gearing up for PIPS Day. Yeah, pretty much all in the same week. Um, so this is a good kickoff to that. Talk about the realities first, and then the inspiration. Yes, exactly. Right, exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
then qualifying for the public service loan forgiveness, and then the PICAP piece, which will help you make your payments. So we'll start out with a little bit of talk about budgeting. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this. You guys are adults. You've been managing money for a long time. So basically, though, when you're talking about budgeting, you're talking about, of course, your whatever your income is going to be, and then learning how to live within that, so that you're living within your means and not going into more debt. There will be some things in your life that are just, are, you're going to have to go into debt for, like it or not. Education is probably one of them. A home will probably be another one. A car will be a short-term one. If you have a family, you're looking further down the road at, at the expenses that they're going to have. So there will be certain things in life that you are going to have expenses for and you are going to have to borrow for. So when you recognize those things, then you can sort of figure out how much money you actually have to live on. And then the best thing is, to, of course, to try to live within your means, not live on credit cards, that kind of thing, but really par down your living. And the way that a person can par down their living is, first of all, sort of figure out what is a need and what is a want. And I have to be honest with you. There was a time in my life, probably, I don't know, my 20s, I hope it was no later than that, <laughs> but I can remember having a discussion with my mother and about this kind of thing. And she said, well, Linda, I only buy what I need. And, I, and that really kind of confused me because I thought, well, I think I need that telephone. You know, I think I need that new suit. You know, that kind of thing. And so it was really kind of hard for me to, to separate the needs from the wants. It seemed so clear to her. But, um, but eventually I started figuring it out. And um, so, yeah, we need a telephone. But we might not need a telephone at home and a telephone in our pocket. You know, there are things. And if we have family members, each one may not need their own separate plan. We can get one plan and add one for $10. I mean, those kind of things you already know. But that's all I think. It's just living within your means and figuring out how to strategize so that you can live successfully within your means. Which, if you're going into public interest, you really need to think about that. And cutting your expenses is the best way to address it. Um, so, we can always talk about that uh, if you ever want to come talk to me about it, but that's in general an approach to budgeting. Um, when, you're looking, when you're looking at your income, always to remember to that, that what your gross income is is not what you're going to take home. Again, I'm probably you know, talking way below your knowledge level here, but, but remember that your gross income, you're going to have some pre-tax deductions, so like your insurance and things like that will come out pre-tax, and then you'll have your taxes coming out, and then whatever's left over is really what you take home and what you have to live on, and sometimes, frankly, it's quite a bit less than what you start with. Okay, let's talk about student loan debt. Um, here at Hastings, the average debt for a third year that graduated last May um, was 113,000, excuse me, 119,000. The example I have later is 113, close enough. Uh, and that was just for Hastings debt. So when you're talking about your overall <laughs> debt for education, you're talking about your Hastings debt, but you're also talking about any undergraduate debt that you might have, you might be bringing to the table. The good news is these payment plans I'm going to be talking about, and even public service loan forgiveness, allows you to include that undergraduate debt. It's not just what you took out for law school, um, it's what you took out as an undergraduate, or if you have a graduate degree, it's that too. So you're really looking, you talk about the, the public service and going in it for 10 years, and when I show you the numbers of how much money you can have forgiven at the end, uh, wiped clean, it's gonna make this career look a whole lot more interesting to you. Not that it isn't already. Um, so, so we'll look at that, um, and I'll give you an example. Um, I think the first place I'm going to take you is to uh, our useful links page, which I already have up here, because I want to bring to your attention, um, this is beginning to fish, uh, where you go to find some, some things. The general financial aid information uh, gives you some good information. What I really want to show you is the, the loan administration, which if you look right here, it's the uh, NSLDS page. And this is really the place for you to start when you start figuring out how much you owe. NSLDS is the Department of Education's website where they show all of your federal aid. So go to this page, 
print it out, and if you're meeting with Dr. Hansen, who will be back in the spring, you meet with him, he requires you to bring this with you because it is such an essential part of his counseling and of what you need to know. Your NSLDS report will show you all the federal, aid, federal debt that you have from undergraduate, any, debt, any federal debt that you have will be on there, education debt. And what you'll learn from that is a lot of useful information. First of all, what kind of loans do you have? There are many different kinds of loans. You may, you may or you may not, depending on how long ago you went to undergraduate school, have a, a federal loan under what we call the FELP program, Family, Federal Family Education Loans. That was the old lender program. Commercial lenders used to do this lending on behalf of the Department of Education. The program was changed several years ago, and now the Department of Education itself is the lender. So that, and those are all called direct loans. So when you look at your NSLDS, you'll see direct loans for some of them. You may see felt loans for some of them. And that's an important distinction. Because under the uh, forgiveness program, the federal forgiveness program, the only loans they can forgive are direct loans. So if you've got a felt loan on your NSLDS report, or if you have a Perkins loan, Perkins loan is a federal loan, but the school is the administrator, so you would pay back the school directly. So that's not a direct loan. You have to make those loans direct in some way. And the way to do that is through uh, direct loan consolidation. So you would go to, um, I've got the student aid, it, it's uh, studentaid.ed.gov, get you started on all of these things. And if you go there and then uh, ask, then Google, or excuse me, search for um, loan consolidation, direct loan consolidation, it'll take you to the page. But that's essentially what you will need to do is get all of your loans to be direct loans in order to qualify for these, um, for the public service loan forgiveness. The NSLDS will also show you how much you owe how much interest has accrued, how much you borrowed. So there, uh, that's additional information that you'll need to know for obviousness. Then managing your student loans. So coming over to this page, um, this is actually, I took you into the, the loan forgiveness page, the public service loan forgiveness page. But here you will see repayment plans, public service loan forgiveness, um, disability discharge, so forth, the things I'm going to focus on today are the repayment plans and the public service loan forgiveness. So let's trip over here to the repayment plans. And here are a number of them on the side you want to think about. Now these, uh, these are calculators too, so the re repayment plan comparison calculator, you know, I'm not too impressed with it to tell you the truth, um, but it, it does let you calculate your, your felt loan payments. But, probably won't even care about that because you'll be consolidating them if you even have any. And then you'll go into either the income-based repayment calculator or the pay-as-you-earn calculator. Income contingent repayment calculator is another one. These are the three, though, that what we call, that we call uh, income-driven plans. And what's special about them is that they actually do look at your income and your personal circumstances to calculate your payment. And these are the only three payment plans that will allow you to qualify for public service loan forgiveness. A couple of other payment plans that you may just be familiar with are the standard repayment plan, repayment plan which you may remember from your early, the first loan counseling that you ever went to, when they talked about repayment plans. The standard is a 10-year fixed repayment plan where you take the amount of money that you borrow and you amortize it out over a 10-year period, you have equal payments every month for 10 years, and then it's done. There's a graduated repayment plan, which is still a 10-year repayment plan, but you start out with your, your payments smaller than standard, gradually they increase, and you're still paid off in 10 years. Most people don't even use those anymore because debt has become so high that hardly anyone can pay it off in 10 years. So then the Department of Education came up with these other plans that would stretch it beyond the 10 years. So maybe a 15-year plan or a 30-year plan, but it was still more or less figured out like a an amortized mortgage, more or less. It didn't really look at in your income to see whether or not you could make the payments. They're just telling you what your payments are. 
Then the department has come up now with these three income-driven plans. Income-based, IBR, as we call it, income contingent, ICR, and then pay as you earn. The difference between them is that the income contingent typically, it's basically based on the formula that they use to come up with your payment. That's what's different. But the income contingent will most likely give you the highest payment of those three income-based repayments. And the income-based repayment itself will be kind of in the middle. And then if you qualify for IBR, or excuse me, for uh, pay as you earn, which has a little bit more uh, criteria to it, then you'll probably have the lowest possible payment. Most people are going to qualify for the IBR, the income-based repayment. And that's probably going to be good enough for you because the beauty of IBR is that it can look at your prior year income, your, uh, uh, your projected year income, or it can look at your tax form to determine what your monthly payment is. It is conceivable that you, uh, that it can look at your information from your prior year if you were a student, and your income-based repayment could actually be zero. That the calculation would come up with a zero payment. That zero payment actually counts toward the 120, which I've mentioned, but on the public service loan forgiveness, it's forgiven after 120 on-time payments, and that zero payment can count as one of those 120 payments. So it is conceivable that you can get into this and really not even have any payments for your first year, and yet have them count. So income-based repayment is the, the one that most of you are going to qualify for, although you should look at all of them. You should see if you qualify for all of them and then pick the lowest if your goal truly is to have your the majority of your loans paid after 10 years, if you're really serious about this and you really intend to be in this profession for 10 years and you think you'll qualify for 10 years and actualize all that forgiveness at the back end, then you want your payment to be as low as possible. Let's look now at uh, the example. So I'm going to flip over here to uh, Jeff's slides and see if I can find the one I want. Uh, come back to Pike. I want to show you the example so you can really kind of start there and be thinking, whoa, this is something I really need to pay attention to. Here's the case study. So if you go to uh, finaid.org, this right here, in your calculators, you'll find the IBR, Income Based Repayment and Public Service Loan Forgiveness Calculator. The example that he has worked up for us is um, student loan debt of 128.5. That's and that's higher than our average. Uh, it shows your monthly payments and so forth. And this is all, if you run your numbers in that calculator, you'll come up with this. Um, it's showing that the total accrued interest forgiven by the department at the end of the day is $43,000. That's because on your income-based repayment uh, or pay as you earn, those, your monthly payment is so low, you're not even paying the, you're not making a dent in the interest on that loan, not to mention the principal. So, so at the end of the day, the end of the 10 years, you would have uh, about $43,000 in interest alone forgiven. And you would have all of your principal forgiven for a total of $172,000 that the Department of Education would forgive for you. And the other beauty of that is that it's not taxable. That $172,000 is like a gift. Um, and, you, and it is not taxable if it's on the public service loan forgiveness. So, this is something to very seriously consider. And you can play with your own numbers in this calculator. Now, in order to qualify for public service loan forgiveness and IBR, I'm going to back up on his slides and we'll talk a little bit about IBR. I'm using that as the main example because that is what most people are going to qualify for. 
These slides are available on our financial aid web pages, and I'll show you where, because he's got a lot of detail here, and I'm not going to go into every one of these slides. It's just, it's a lot of detail, a lot of this down. But basically, here's what we're talking about. In order to qualify for the IBR, um, or the pay as you earn, you must establish a partial financial hardship. And essentially, it, it exists when you have a situation like this. Your standard year repayment is greater than the IBR or the pay as you earn payment. Essentially, what that means is that you qualify for a lesser payment than the standard 10 year. Pay as you earn is the one I said is a little bit more complicated. Not everybody will qualify for that. More people will qualify for IBR. And essentially, the additional qualifications are you must have been a new borrower after, on or after October of 2007, and um, you must have had a, a federal loan dispersed on or after 2011, October 1st, 2011. Some of you will qualify for that. Then you have to establish what we call partial financial hardship. And to establish that, it looks at your household AGI, your household size, and then the federal poverty guidelines. Your AGI and your spouse's AGI. There are a couple of formulas. There's this 10% uh, is the pay as you earn formula. Uh, the IBR is a 15% uh, formula. But actually, after 2014, the IBR will have the same calculation as the pay as you earn. Then uh, on these slides, here's a sample sort of of uh, what your IBR payments might be based on your income and your household size. And this is the caveat to this. Remember I mentioned that if you are paying on this loan and you're using one of these payment plans and you actually, you're paying less than the interest owed on it, if you don't go through with the 10 years, then essentially what has been happening is that you really haven't been paying much on that loan. And there is a negative amortization, meaning that if you were then to no longer qualify for an IVR payment, um, or you decide not to do the public service, or you weren't looking at that forgiveness anymore, then you've got a situation where the interest that was accrued, that accrued on those loans would then be added in to the principal, and your payments would be de determined again. Um, now, one thing I do want to mention about IVR too, is that you keep jazz about it, and mainly I'm talking about it as it relates to the public service loan forgiveness and a 10 year payment plan. But one thing you might want to know is that the IBR plan itself um, can be for anyone based on their income and family size and amount of debt. You don't have to be going into public service loan and, and be planning to actualize the forgiveness um, in order to qualify for IBR. Anybody who goes to school anywhere can apply for the IBR and possibly qualify. And it has its own uh, forgiveness provision at the end. It just happens to be a lot further out. It's about 25 years out. But if you were to qualify, let's say you're working, um, you just have to be in public service. So if you're working in public service and qualify, or excuse me, you just have to be working, uh, well, IBR, it doesn't matter where you work. It's based on your income and so forth. And if you do that for 25 years, then you do have some forgiveness at the end. Uh, but the thing about this accruing interest or, or this uh, negative amortization is just to keep that in mind as part of your strategy. I mean, there are situations where you might want to use the IBR, even if you're not intending to, to have a career in public service, um, or you may not be planning to actualize the 10-year forgiveness, but you can still use the, MB, the IBR payment as part of your financial strategy to get your, maybe you want for a while your payments to be as low as possible so you can do some other things with your discretionary income, like build up your six-month reserve that they always tell us we should have for the rainy day, or uh, save for something else. So there is a way for you to use this IBR strategy uh, for your long-term financing, um, and if you want to think it through that way, you just have to take into consideration the cost of the possible um, negative amortization, but there are strategies to use the IBR beyond the public service. Questions? Okay, we already looked at the, the case study. So, 
So just kind of recapping at this point, um, well, get your NSLDS, look at the different kinds of loans that you have, make a decision about whether or not you need to consolidate any of these to be direct loans, then um, you will want to pick your repayment plan, go online and apply, pick your repayment plan, then you'll be thinking about the, the public service loan forgiveness itself and how you act. Actual, actual, actualize <laughs> that. So there are several things that you want to think about. Um, the public service, uh, okay. So to apply for the forgiveness, um, we talked about they, they all need to be direct loans. You have to be working in um, a 501c3 organization or a government agency. You have to be working full time, which is defined as 30 hours, minimum of 30 hours a week, or whatever your employer defines as full time. And then you must make 120 qualifying uh, on-time payments. And an on-time payment is defined as a payment within 15 days of the due date. So in other words, it can't be more than 15 days late. Now one thing that we have discovered in working with a lot of our students who are, who are getting set up for this is that there's something that is not written into the information that you find on the Department of Ed's website or anywhere else, and that is that if you make an early payment, a payment 20 days before the due date, it doesn't count toward public service loan forgiveness. So it's very, so you need to keep in mind, and that's something that you'll only learn here at Hastings. <laughs> so you discover it. But we're, I'm gonna try to get it fixed, at least try to get them, I mean, try to fix meaning, write it in so people know, because I've run into situations here where we've had graduates who have gotten a windfall, you know, somebody gave them a birthday present or something, and they made an early payment, and then lo and behold, it didn't count. So, um, so those are the things. The way it stands right now, no more, no more than 20 days before, no more than 15 days afterward. But the payments do not have to be consecutive, meaning that if you need to take time off of your work uh, to do something else, and you've made, let's say you've made 50 payments, you're taking some time off to do something else, and you're not working, you're not in qualifying employment, but then a month later or a year later, you come back and you are in qualifying payment, or qualifying employment, and everything else fits, all the, the other pieces of the puzzle fit, then you can pick up with your loan payments again and have them count. So the eligible loans, we kind of already hit on this, they have to be direct. So when you look at your NSLDS, make sure that that word direct is in front of it. But when you look at it, you could have a subsidized direct loan or an unsubsidized direct loan. You could have, and many of you will, direct graduate plus loans or you could have your direct uh, consolidation loans. And if you, again, if you have Perkins on that, um, it's kind of, there's some special considerations about that because it's a very low interest rate, it's 5% and so forth. So there are some, uh, under some circumstances, you may not want to include that in your consolidation loan. We can talk about that individually. But um, generally speaking, most people probably would because if you're really serious about, the, about this forgiveness, at the end of the day, you might as well have them forgive your Perkins too. But Perkins does have some built-in forgiveness provisions of its own, if you go into law enforcement, for example. So those are, there are considerations. Back to this page. We talked about this. There are, you know, as I mentioned, the three, um, uh, income driven plans. He's got the standard repayment plan here because that is one that qualifies, but the 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 weird thing about that is that the standard payment is ten years. So that would mean that you would have paid it off in ten years. There wouldn't be anything left to forgive. So um, the pros and cons. You know the pros are as we've talked about that that actually makes um, going into public interest a really viable option. 
a very viable option. In fact, I think people who are going to be going into public interest now are actually going to be in better shape at the end of 10 years than people who don't because you're going to have your loans forgiven and people who are doing other things are not. I mean, they may on the IBR 25 years from now, or 20 years from now, but they're not in, going to be in, as, in good a shape as, as people who really get serious about the public interest and, uh, and see it through for the 10 years and qualify. Um, it is an entitlement, which means I, I, mean, I hear people saying, is this, but is it going to be there when I get there? You know, well, at this point in time, it's an entitlement, so yes, it should be there. When you get there and you should not have to worry about it going away. The con is that it's an all or nothing. You can't apply for it and qualify for it for two or three years and see some forgiveness. You don't see a dime of forgiveness until the end of the 10 years. So you have to go through with it for the 120 and you have to qualify all along the way for the 120 payments. Um, only the direct loans, but we've told you about how to get that fixed. And uh, this point is that it's current, there's currently no process to confirm your eligibility. What he means by that is that there, that's changed a little bit, I think, since he created that slide. But there is a form that I'll talk a little bit more about later. Maybe this is the time to talk about it. That um, it's called employment certification form. And if you complete that uh, at the time that you're doing your IVR, you're calculating your IVR payment. If you if you are you employed and you do your employment certification form, that is sent to a specific direct loan servicer, and it's Fed Loan Servicing, F-E-D-L-O-A-N, one word, loan servicing, and that name and, and all that is on the form itself, and that form is on our uh, public, our PICAT page, our repayment page, which I'll show you in a little bit. But that form actually is a signal to the Department of Ed that you're thinking about going into public service, uh, and that that is your plan. So what happens when Fed Loan Servicing gets this form is that they go out then to your other services. Let's say you happen to be with Sally May. They then pull all of that, your portfolio, into Fed Loan Servicing. And they are then going to help keep you on track. Because the other thing about IBR that I did not mention is that it's an annual calculation. So you have to reapply for the IBR or the pay as you earn, those payment plans, every year because your income changes and your circumstances change. So you have to reapply every year, and it's very important that you do it on time. If you don't do it on time, you will automatically be kicked into the 10-year standard repayment plan. So your payments, this is the longest stretch, but it could go from zero to $1,000 or $1,500 a month. And you have to make that payment. And then you can get on some, you know, you get back, in, back into IVR or something else. So it is just essential that you stay on top of that um, renewal date for your IVR payment. Fed Loan Servicing has said that they are going to help people try to remember that. They'll send out reminders. Um, the other thing that they are going to do, which he's saying there, there's no process, there is a process now with Fed Loan Servicing. Once you get everything over there, then they also, their plan is when you apply for the IVR each year, they will send you a form that tells you what your IVR payment is and how many of your payments that you've made count toward the public service loan forgiveness. So that's the document that you will need. You'll need 10 of those. At the end of the 10 years, you'll need 10 of those documents. I mean, it's the easiest way to then go back to the Department of Education and say, yes, I qualify for public service loan forgiveness. Because the Department of Ed at this point in time, because we have about six or so more years before anybody will actually qualify for it, they don't have even an application in place for you to apply for public service loan forgiveness. They will have by the time you get there. But in the meantime, you need to be keeping track of every year you know, your employer uh, that is qualifying employment, which you can do with that certification form that you send to Fed Loan Servicing, and the payments that you made that count toward public service loan forgiveness. You need to stay in charge and on top of your own record so that at the end of the 10 years, you've got all the ammunition you need to fill out whatever application they come up with and then get, get your loan forgiveness. So, um, so you will see a form that shows you how many of your payments count toward loan forgiveness and that's actually what we saw that was the clue 
that this person who had been making 12 on-time payments only got um, only 11 of them counted toward public service loan forgiveness. And that's, that was the red flag that went up. And the only way we picked up on that is because we're counseling with people uh, because of our HICAP program, and we're really connecting one-on-one -on -one with people. And you know, if you're meeting with Jeff, he might pick up on something like that. So, um, of course, you won't be in repayment most of the time when you're talking with Jeff, but you will be able to talk with us. Um, so it's, it's those kinds of things, though, but it's the, you will be getting that form. So we basically made all of these points. Um, this is the employer certification that he's talking about, and then uh, making your monthly payments. Okay. So, um, so say you've got all of this in place, you've got your IBR, you've filled out your employer certification, you're on track, all of your loans are over with Fed Loan Servicing. Anytime you have an issue or a question, you can call them and talk to them. Then uh, your payments, uh, the Hastings will help you make some of those payments. So on our web pages, if you come over to Loan and Payment, PICAP, you'll see this. And um, before I go into the details of that program, I'm just slide down here to show you a few things down here under References. Um, I've got the Department of Education, their main page is listed here. So if you just come over to our PICAP page, this might be the quickest way for you to find some of these things you might be looking for, a repayment estimator, public service repayment cert employer certification, that's where it is. This is other information about PSLF, and here's finaid.org, fin um, where in the link to the income-based repayment calculator that I showed you, so you can go in and play with the numbers, find out how much money you're going to have for it. Our program is um, Morphe. <coughs> Every year it's Morphe, but you can, um, but the, the beauty of the Hastings Loan Forgiveness Program is that it's been around since the 80s. It was, Hastings was one of the first schools, not only was it the first law school, west of the Rockies, or whatever, whatever the coin phrase is, um, we were the first school pretty much to come up with a loan repayment program. It goes back that far. And so that's what I call here the traditional um, pie cap. But you won't even need to concern yourself with it because you won't be um, qualifying for that one. You don't really care to anyway. It didn't include private loans or it didn't include, uh, which is now Grab Plus, which we're taking out instead of private loans. So you won't need to concern yourself about that one. It's this one, IBR, Income-Based Repayment, and Public Service Loan Forgiveness. And here, here are the guidelines for the 2013. And when I say it's morphine, uh, what I mean by that is that every year we go through it, and depending upon how much money we have and how many people are in the program, we can do, we can change certain things, or we can be more lenient. That's what it is, basically. And the program, for many years, uh, actually had a higher budget than we had people in it actualizing it. So basically, when you're in a circumstance like that, we just sort of threw open the gates, you know? If you are, in other words, under the traditional program, just as an example, in order to qualify for that, your job actually had to be law-related. So it was, it was pretty specific. Um, when we got into the public service loan forgiveness uh, and had plenty of money, and there were fewer students in it, our graduates, we could say, well, you know, uh, we're just happy you've got a job. You know, and that it's, that it's in 501c3 or a government agency. You know, if it's not exactly law related, you know, we can work with that. Um, so there are sort of things like that that we were able to, to really broaden um, the umbrella. Well, now, and so basically we said if you qualify for public service loan forgiveness, federal program, you qualify for PICAP. So we were able to do that for a few years, and now we're kind of at a point where we have a, that is just about equal. Uh, it's not many people coming in as, and going out um, as we can fund. And that actually just happened within the last year. So what we're looking at now is to, we want to keep this program to be really viable. We were at a point where we were funding people at 100% of whatever your payment was. If your payment was you know, $500 a month, we paid $500 a month. 
well, what we, we really can't do that anymore and continue to take people in and make it meaningful for everyone. So we're looking at ways to change it, um, but still make it really meaningful so that you do have help when you go into public service because that's, that's what it's all about. So within this last year, uh, what we did was make a change to bring the percentage, instead of it being 100% in these cases, we brought it down to 70%. But even that is still a very nice payment for you to get to help you make your payments. And depending upon, uh, we're looking at other things to shore up, like maybe we might make a slight difference in whether or not the, um, the job is law related. I mean, we basically, when I say we, I'm talking about I have a committee of, of the faculty here who basically we're brainstorming about how to keep this program um, reasonable, sensible, so it's really helping people, but at the same time look at it long term and be planning for the future as to how to keep this viable for the long haul. Because we've had it since the 80s and we don't want it going away, which I, there's a chance of that, but we want to make it meaningful for the long time, the long term. So we know that the IBR and the Public Service Loan Forgiveness, those parameters are so broad that we can't continue to fund according to their rules. We, have, we will have to you know, bring in our own rules or, or tighten our own shoelaces to some degree. So there will be a few changes in here, but I think at this, at this point, um, the main change that you might be thinking about is whether we'll bring the percentage down from you know, 70 to something less than that. I don't see us going below like 50. But even if we were to make a 50% payment for you, it's 50% less than your pay, you know, than you would have to come up with. And I think that's still um, very reasonable and very exciting. Um, so in this program, as it, this will be tweaked for 2014. Um, one, the, the dates in here and so forth are changing because one of the uh, one of the major changes that we are making is basically a calendar issue. It uh, was based on a calendar year program. So people who were graduating in May had to get all their ducks in a row, you know, by January, the first part of the year, in order to come into the program. Um, taking it back to the, the traditional, just as a side note, it used to be that a person actually had to be in public interest for a whole year uh, before they could even come into the program at all. So one of the parameters that we broadened was, we don't care if you've been in for a year, if you've only been in six months, you know, we're gonna let you in the program. Uh, but what we're gonna do now is change it from a calendar year to a fiscal year, which actually makes more sense for budgeting purposes, but it also makes more sense because what we learned is that you've got a grace period on a lot of these loans. You're taking the bar, you're getting established in a job in the fall, and you might go into repayment, in January or so, but more often than not, by the time you get your loans consolidated, you get set up for IBR, there's usually a period of forbearance, and you really, many people don't make their first payment until like April or, or about that time in the next spring. So it really didn't fit so well with recent grads anyway. So for a lot of different reasons, it seemed to make sense to have the start period be on July in July. So we'll be doing that this coming year, that's one of the changes. So some of the calendars, uh, the dates that you look at in here will not be accurate for you when you get into the program. But um, suffice to say that this is updated and will be out in December of each year. So when it's your time to, to think about this, um, you know, come here and look at it for December and you'll have the most up-to-date information. Yes? Does that percentage of repayment come out uh, vary year per year or once it's repaid? Is it the same? Percentage year. I mean, uh, well, it, did, it, it varies. This is a complicated part of the process. It varies because your payment varies. So that's why we're talking about percentage because each year when you apply for IPR and you have a different uh, income, your payment will be different. And uh, so my, what we pay you will be different. My question is does the percentage vary year to year? You get locked in at one percentage for 10 years. Well, it. You're not locked in for 10 years. You're not locked into the same percentage for 10 years. So it changes every year. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it depends on where you fit in the, in the, in the scale. Because actually what I didn't show you is that there is a scale. Maybe what's confusing. 
So here's the way it had been. You know, for your first 12 payments, you were at 70%. That's what it is now. And then at 13 to 24, we were paying 72. Um, and, and so on. So that, you know, at the end, we were paying 80. Um, and it, it used to be that all these 80s were 100. We got to this point. So this is where we have ratcheted it down to a point. So it depends on where you are and what payments you're making. And, now, and then now the, this grid will change for 2014 also, right? Mm -hmm. Probably. Although we haven't come down to that yet, but probably. And, you know, we're looking at all kinds of things and brainstorming about all kinds of things, like maybe flipping it and maybe having the highest, let's say if it's a scale, have the 80% be during the first 1 to 12 when you really maybe need it the most and then have it go the other way as your income increases, the percentage that we would pay. So we're really um, trying to think outside the box and really uh, change this in a way that works, that works well for everyone. So on this, mm -hmm. yes. Where does the funding for PICAP come from? Good question. Um, can we help watch the timing? Yeah, it's, it's five up. Okay. Uh, this is to one thirty. Okay, good. Um, the pie, the funding comes from tuition revenue. It is the majority of it comes from there. So that's another thing that we have to take into consideration as we're reducing the size of the JD class because this is only a program for JDs. We'll have less revenue, and so the the return to this program could be less. So it's just another thing that we need to think about long term. Is that we haven't been promised that we get to keep the budget the same even though we're reducing the, the revenue that's coming in. So there are lots of considerations. Thank you. But essentially for our program, you would have uh, looked at the information in, let's say, December for your year. And, um, and in the meantime, you would be consolidating your loans or getting set up on IBR or you know, doing your employment certification for Fed Loan Servicing, getting all your, your loans moved over there, do your forbearance for a couple of months if you need to before you go into repayment. And then fill out the PICAP paperwork. Then the way our program works is that we give you in advance uh, a six month payment to help you make your loan payments. Then at the end of the six months, you give us documentation that shows that you made your payments on time. And then we forgive the, I forgot to mention it, but the pie cap we give you is actually a loan, but it's a forgivable loan, what we call a forgivable loan. So once you show us documentation that you made the payments that, that you were expected to make, then we forgive the loan we gave you and turn around and give you another one. So it's on a rolling basis like that every six months. Any questions about that? There are situations where a person's payment might change within that six month period, um, and we work with those situations individually. You know, if you got too much pie cap in one term, you know, we might reduce it a little bit in the next term just so that it evens out. We try usually not to have to make you pay us back. If some of you need to go, don't feel badly about it. more to say about this. I mean, there's lots of information here. Um, you're welcome to browse through it. There's also uh, information on the, the Department of Ed's web pages, um, lots about the repayment plans and that sort of thing. If you want to come talk to me uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis about any of this, I'm happy to talk to you. Jeff Hansen will be back in the spring. If you want to meet with him again for a 30-minute session to sit down and talk with him, that would be fine also. And I think I'll break now and uh, go into his question and answers if you like. Yes. I have a question about job types. Okay. Are there ever any issues where you're looking at public, public issues where that's not legal or perhaps the type of organization not following a C3 or government entity that can be some sort of enterprise or working for a charter school organization that's not following a C3? Uh, well, are you talking about for the Federal Public Service Loan Forgiveness, or are you talking right. about for Forgiveness? Right. Okay, uh, let me take you over to, uh, I want to show you where you can get that. Um, 
um, under the department, this is back to our PICAP page. Under um, Department of Ed, here are the Q&As. And um, part of this actually does go into that about uh, what a qualifying employer is. And I can just tell you that the that it's basically a 501c3 or a government agency. And there are there are the federal public service loan forgiveness is for firefighters, nurses, teachers, um, college administrators, you know, uh, people that, again, 501c3 primarily, there may be a few slight exceptions to that. Um, and you could you could call Fed Loan Servicing to talk about nuances, um, and they would be able to tell you whether or not the employer you're thinking about would qualify. Um, and I'm not sure exactly where that is on here, but it does address it in these Q and A's. Generally, though, it's 501c3 or government agency. One uh, determination we've made about our PICAP program, though, uh, that you might be interested in, is that we have determined that Lawyers for America, if you're working with Lawyers for America, uh, does qualify for our program, PICA. The bridge program, fortunately, does not. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, if you're married, does this factor in your um, joint income? It does. Uh, you mean for the IBR? Yeah. Okay. Yes, for the IBR payment, it can or it doesn't have to. You know, it depends. Um, it depends on whether or not you file jointly. Um, so if you go back to the IBR calculator, um, it will ask you those questions, oh. single or married, family. So, and then once you, um, the next slide, after you fill in, and let's say with Mary, um, it asks you if you file jointly or separately, and does your spouse have loans? and then your family size and so forth, and then it calculates it. So it really determines on how you file. And it's to your advantage to file separately? It, uh, it could if, um, if you are the only one that has debt. If you're the only one that has education debt, then yes. You should run the numbers, but generally speaking, yes. Because your income would be less and your debt high, which would mean that you qualify for the lowest payment. Is there anything else that you can think of that I didn't cover? Um, no, that was really thorough. Thank you. You probably said this, but I've I missed it. Do you consolidate under direct loans upon graduation, or do you elect a direct loan when you first take out loans and come to law school? Um, the loans that you're receiving today are all direct. They are all direct. Right. Okay. So the only time a person has to consolidate is if you have old loans from undergraduate mm -hmm. um, that might be the felt loans, or if you have a Perkins loan and you want to convert it to direct. Okay. Those would be the reasons to consolidate. Okay. Great. And Linda, none of the private loans factor into this. If you check out private loans, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's that's right. right. The private loans do not for either program. For either program. Public service or for the high cap. Yes? Uh, even though private loans aren't for, for calculating your payment, they say you have four or five loans that reduces the amount of direct credit you're taking. Do they adjust, like, is it adjusted so that they at least take the cap you have other loans you have to pay off and the payments left? No. Um, the payments are actually going to be reduced. Um, the payments are going to be reduced. Um, the payments are going to be reduced. No. Because the Department of Education is only interested in loans where they are the lender. They, they, can't, they can only forgive their own loans. So they are only looking at that debt. What they're, so they're not looking at your other consumer debt that you have at all. They're looking at your income and your family size uh, and the amount of your debt. Well, I'm not talking so much about forgiveness. I'm just talking about like the payment. Like if someone owes a larger amount of money in like, federal loans than somebody else, then the payment should be the same, right? Because if your federal loans are small and you just and you have a particular payment, you might pay it all off, even though they're not they're not reimbursing you anything because you'll have your payment plan will have you paid off all your any or most. Uh, I'm not sure I quite understand the it. Um, well, because if you're looking at IBR, 
it does make a difference the amount of debt that you have and your income. So, if you're, so if you're talking about a person who has mostly private debt and a little bit of federal debt versus a person who has a lot of federal debt and a little private, well, maybe just a bar loan, private, then um, you know the first person may not qualify for IVR at all. Or, um, and, and this, I would say that the first person must, would probably have a lower payment, probably because you have less debt, and the second person would have a larger payment because they have the more debt. But it also depends on whether or not the person is married, and how many dependents you have, and there are just other factors. It's hard to make a blanket statement. Yeah. I want to make sure I uh, didn't overlook something. All these uh, repayments. Uh, are based on just income, not assets in any way, and savings? EGI. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. Linda, can you just touch on what kind of person is the ideal candidate for income contingent and pay as you go? Um, income contingent, I hardly even think about because it mm -hmm. yields a higher payment. And what we in our in the pie cap, we were saying, apply for all of them, you have to take the lowest one. So that pie cap can pay on the lowest possible payment and stretch the money further. Uh, the, the pay as you earn really has to do with when you took out loans. And um, it, so it's, you had to have a loan by that October 2007 date, none before that mm -hmm. is the way it is. And then you have to have one after October 1st, 2011. So there's a window of people that would even qualify to apply for that. And then, and then the formula is slightly different um, because it's looking at, um, I believe it's 10% of discretionary income, whereas the IVR is looking at 15. But all the pay as you earn is, is what legislation has determined that the IVR will be in 2014. All the pay as you earn did was take that, uh, they found, found a way to make that program available to this certain niche of people earlier in 2014. So in 2014, it'll probably essentially kind of go away, pay as you earn, because everybody, if you qualify for IVR, you get the same benefit. Thank well, you. We did end up having more time than I thought that we would need, but we did go over some. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.